Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure for us that you join this webinar. We start our new bi-monthly webinar on selected topics, which is a way how we would like to support you as distributors or end users to get more specific information on selected topics and become even successful. Today, we are going to present selected cardiac and cardiovascular markers. And consequently, in the other part of the webinar, to introduce markers relevant for differential diagnosis between viral and bacterial infections. After the presentations, we would be very happy to answer your questions. You may put via chat, chat during the presentation. Let's go ahead and start the first topic, cardiovascular markers. Cardiovascular markers is really a very extensive topic. On our product list, there are microRNA assays, antibodies, proteins, planar arrays, and 58 ELISA kits. I have selected only a few of them for today's webinar. Specifically, I am going to focus in particular on CEIVD assays, namely heart fatty acid binding protein, myosin binding protein, antipro ANP, antipro BMP, GDF15, symmetric and asymmetric Demeter arginine assays. I will start with a brief background to understand what is the gap and we are targeting on. If heart attack is suspected, electrocardiography is used for the first triage on individuals either with ST segment elevation, called STEMI, or patient without persistent ST segment elevation. Patient without persistent ST segment elevation undergo further laboratory investigation according to the guideline from 2016. Cardiac troponin or high sensitive cardiac troponin is determined to triage individuals into three groups, rule out or rule in or in observation zone. About 50% of the patients after their initial laboratory investigation are in observation zone and troponin should be retested in one or three hours schedule. The observation zone represents very high percentage of all patients involved, and it is believed that its reduction, for example, by using novel markers, can significantly improve the outcome. One of those novel markers is heart fatty acid binding protein. It is a small cytostolic protein expressed predominantly in the cardiac myocytes and at much lower levels in skeletal muscle, kidney, liver, and small intestine. HFBP can quickly pass through the kidney. It can be determined also in urine. HFBP is released from cardiac myocytes following an ischemic episode and can be detected in the blood within, between 30 minutes and 3 hours after chest pain onset. The combination of HFBP and troponin shows improved sensitivity over troponin alone in diagnosis, in diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction. HFBP also has prognostic value. It is proved to be a statistically significant predictor of that in myocardial infarction. The prognostic value is independent of troponin and the statistical significance persists after age and kidney function adjustment. Due to low molecular weight and the cytoplasmatic location, HFBP is released from cardiomyocytes extremely, extremely quickly after an ischemic episode. Troponin is predominantly released in necrosis after degradation by lysozyme and sarcolemar disruption. Troponin serum levels remain increased for 7 days for troponin I and 10 for 10 days for troponin T. HFBP concentration typically peak at approximately 7 hours after symptom onset and return to normal values within 24 hours. Also, HFBP has similar release kinetics to myoglobin. It is approximately 20 times more cardiac specific. A secondary benefit of HFBP release kinetics is that it returns to the baseline very rapidly and can be therefore used as marker for reinfarction in the days following the first episode. 
Reinfarction is observed within the next seven days in about 1% cases. The combination of HFBP and cardiac troponin I provides sensitivity 82% and specificity 86% in diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction. In a prospective observation study on patients with acute coronary syndrome, both troponin I and HFBP were measured after onset and after one year. Priced Raised concentrations of HFBP were strongly predictive of mortality across the full range of troponin I concentrations. In addition, patients who were negative for both HFBP and troponin I at six months exhibit zero mortality and could be considered as individuals at very low risk. In our studies, HFBP was associated with age, Actually, its level was raised in controls over 50 of age. Diagnostic potential of age-adjusted HFBP was evaluated using receiver operating characteristic analysis and showed increased clinical sensitivity and specificity indicating the relevance for its use in practice. Our human HFBP ELISA kit is CEIVD. It is a very sensitive assay with the limit detection of 6 picogram per ml and measuring range between 20 and 1280 picogram per ml. The assay employs biotin labeled antibody and takes about 3 hours to run. The kit is not suitable for urgent medicine, but for clinical studies thanks to competitive price. Another novel cardiac marker is cardiac mucin binding protein C, also known as CMYC or MYBPC3. Similarly to HFBP, cardiac mucin binding protein C is released earlier and rises faster following cardiac necrosis than high sensitive troponin T. Mucin binding protein C significantly improves the early triage of patients with suspected myocardial infarction directly at admission. Myosin binding protein C is cardiac tissue specific protein. Therefore, very high clinical specificity can be expected uh, for the assay. Several key studies have been published quite recently by group Professor Meyer and Professor Marber in patient after myocard infarction. They showed that clinical specificity and sensitivity of myosin binding protein C is at least similar or even better as for troponin T. Also, kinetics of release and absolute serum concentration suggest its significant value in diagnostics. Myosin binding protein C has better triage capability over high sensitive troponin T resulting in a reduced observation in zone width, rule out 10 picogram per ml and rule in 120 picogram per ml. The next cardiac markers are anti-pro BMP and anti-pro ANP. Anti-pro BMP is well known and often used in routine diagnostics. There is expanding use of anti-pro BMP in practice, and next to main application for the diagnosis of heart failure, also for risk stratification of acute coronary syndrome, or for therapy monitoring, is used. There is more than 10 global 10 top diagnostic platforms offering assays for analyzers. They all use the same peptide as standard and differ in antibodies used in assays. All of them are validated for heart failure, but only six of them also for acute coronary syndrome stratification and probably the only one for therapy monitoring. The prevalence in the population is between 1 and 2% in Europe. It is very high and uh, additionally 2% annual growth is observed. There is also countries 
such as Malaysia, with almost 7% prevalence in the population. The guideline from European Society of Cardiology recommends to use antipro BMP, BNP, and mid region pro ANP for heart failure assessment. Measurement of plasma natriuretic peptides is recommended in all patients with acute dyspnea and suspected from acute heart failure to help the differentiation between cardiac and non cardiac causes. Antipro BMP and mid region pro ANP are almost equivalent for such purpose. Our anti-pro BMP assay kit is for research use only, and we target especially on researchers involved in small clinical studies. Nevertheless, uh, there is very good correlation between our and Roche assays. Mid-region pro ANP is a central part of anti-terminal pro BMP. Mid-region pro-ANP is considered to be more stable than the whole peptide anti pro anp but both peptides have similar clinical outcome. As far as I know, uh, there are only few anti pro anp assays for in vitro diagnostics on market and can be used for prognosis of atrial fibrillation. Research applications are connected to high blood pressure, metabolic disorders, or local inflammatory reactions. One more parameter in the topic should be mentioned. Galactin-3 is promoted by a bot on architect as marker of chronic heart failure. The test is also offered by Biomere on Vidas platform. I think galactin-3 seems to be multipotent parameter and high galactin levels are linked also to inflammation, fibrosis, or cancer progression. This parameter is not in the guidelines, at least in Europe. GDF15, growth differentiation factor 15. It is another laboratory parameter with a very good potential for routine analysis. It is currently promoted by Roche as marker of bleeding in patients with atrial fibrillation anticoagulant therapy. Recent study published by Berg in circulation compared three main laboratory parameters, cardiac troponin T, antipro BMP, and GDF15 in patient after stroke or embolism in comparison to major bleeding patient with atrial fibrillation. Outcome of the study proved high sensitivity troponin T, antipro BMP, and GDF15 as independently associated with higher rate of stroke and high rate of bleeding. In the bar chart, there are individual laboratory parameters presented for specific ranges in dependence on the annual event rates. Among individual laboratory parameters, high sensitive troponin T showed most significant response. Over the individual parameters, risk scores providing significantly improved outcome are often used at present. Novel biomarker-based risk score for predicting stroke or major bleeding in patients with atrial fibrillation are called ABC stroke score and the ABC bleeding score. They were evaluated by Hiazi from Uppsala University in Sweden in 2016. ABC scores are guideline recommended and very well validated on almost 15,000 individuals. Free calculators are available on the website and the risk score presented as percentage is calculated after entering the values directly in the form. For example, for this, for this specific data, there is almost 1.6% risk of bleeding predicted in one year. It is a very simple tool for clinicians or clinical researchers to exploit their data from GDF15 or antipro BMP measurements. The relative contributions of each variable of ABC bleeding score is, is presented on the picture. The components H, previous bleeding, 
hemoglobin, GDF15, and high-sensitive troponin T are involved in ABC bleeding score calculation. The performance of the ABC score is shown on the graph with cumulative incidence in three years. Green curve belongs to individuals with low risk, blue line to middle risk, and the red one to high risk individuals. There are similar data for ABC stroke score calculation. Actually, stroke is not today topic. However, I believe it makes sense to mention it. Antipro BMP is also subject of the webinar. The strongest predictor of stroke and systemic embolism are Antipro BMP, H, history of stroke, and high sensitive troponin T mirroring the components of the ABC stroke score. Including additional biomarkers such as GDF15, cystatin C, D dimer, or smoking did not improve the prognostic performance in the model. And again, the performance of the ABC score with cumulative incidence in three years for low risk, middle risk, and high risk individuals are presented. The kid human GDF15 ELISA from our product is CEIVD and was validated for serum and plasma from analytical point of view. Many clinical studies were performed with EDTA plasma. Therefore, EDTA plasma is most relevant sample for GDF15 measurement. You can find references on bivalent ELISA kit in the section product references. The documents including product data sheet, MSDS, or certificate of analysis you can find in the section docs. Now I would like to approach to the last two parameters related to cardiovascular disorders. Asymmetric dimethyl arginine, and in a context I will mention also symmetric dimethyl arginine. Asymmetric dimethyl arginine is an inhibitor of nitric oxide synthase, and therefore high concentration of asymmetric dimethyl arginine can reduce nitric oxide oxygen effects in many processes such as vasodilatation, platelet aggregation, monocytes adhesion, vascular smooth muscle cell proliferation, superoxid radical release, and LDL oxidation. In contrast to ADMA, symmetric dimethyl arginine is not a direct inhibitor of nitric oxide synthase, but can indirectly inhibit the enzyme by two mechanisms. By competition with ADMA for tubular absorption in the kidney, which consequently increases ADMA concentration in blood, and by inhibition of arginine transport into the endothelial cells via amino acid transporter called Way plus. Arginine is the substrate for nitric oxide production. That is why uh, less, less intracellular arginine results in less nitric oxide level. On the next slide, there is a diagram for ADMA and ESMA production and elimination. Both symmetric and asymmetric dimethyl arginine are generated from amino acid arginine. The major route for asymmetric dimethyl arginine elimination is through the hydrolytic degradation by the enzyme called DTAH, and ESMA is mainly emitted by renal excretion. Based on the biological effects and elimination, asymmetric dimethyl arginine is considered as a marker of endothelial dysfunction and symmetric dimethyl arginine as a marker of chronic kidney disease. As mentioned, ADMA inhibits nitric oxide production and consequently increases vasoconstriction and blood pressure. There is also evidence that ADMA levels correlates with intima media thickness of the carotid artery and provides the best prognosis for the degree of thickness progression. ADMA directly impairs endothelial function its own pathway based on inhibition of nitric oxide synthase, which is different from all other risk factors, and therefore it is independent parameter from them. On the other hand, ADMA in, in plasma is influenced by kidney function because it is partly eliminated in kidney, and this is the main limitation for its clinical use. 
Determination of ADMA levels can be recommended for evaluation of subclinical atherosclerosis in all patients with primary hypertension. This is the most important clinical application for ADMA measurement. Being the established relationship between ADMA concentration and endothelial dysfunction, many clinical studies have shown elevated ADMA blood levels in association with diseases such as hypercholesterolemia, diabetes mellitus, heart failure, liver failure, preeclampsia, chronic kidney failure, or secondary hypertension. Data in the table represent four differences in ADMA concentrations between patient and healthy controls in selected diseases. In general, there can be expected about two times higher ADMA concentration in these patients. In clinical trials, both symmetric and asymmetric Demeter arginine provide relevant data on cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. In the case of ADMA, the direct mechanism of action is well described, whereas in the case of asthma, only indirect effects are anticipated. However, a number of studies showed comparable, in some cases, even better results for asthma. And this is a surprising finding. Therefore, both ADMA together with asthma should be definitely considered for assessment of cardiovascular risk in clinical studies. Pivondot distributes two assay kits for determination of ADMA. Both are competitive ELISA kits, and the one is high sensitive and is used for research use only. The second one is called ADMA Fast ELISA and is three times less sensitive, but CEI VD certified and faster. Actually, the procedure takes less than three hours. There is no cross reactivity with ESMA and excellent performance characteristics. The ASE correlates perfectly with ADMA, uh, determined by mass spectrometry. I should mention that there is over 300 publications with these kits. The normal value is presented in the Peru data sheet, and it is between 0.4 and 0.7 micromole per liter. I mentioned this so one can estimate ADMA values over 1.5 micromole per liter to be the risk value. There are also two assay kits for asthma. The first one for human, which is CEIVD, and the other one for veterinary use, specifically for dogs and cats. In humans, as well as in animals, asthma increases in chronic kidney disease with about 30% loss of kidney function and enable to diagnose chronic kidney disease much earlier than creatinine or cystatin C tests. Several studies have found that one in three cats and one in torn decks dogs are likely to develop a kidney disease during their lifetime, so it might be a say very frequently used on that field. ESMA in humans also provides relevant data on cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, as mentioned earlier. In the second part of the webinar, I would like to present selected laboratory markers used in inflammation and infection. Laboratory investigations such as erythrocyte sedimentation rate and uh, acute phase reactance are traditionally used as markers of inflammation and infection. This includes their potential role in early diagnosis to differentiate uh, infections and non-infectious diseases for prognosis or antibiotic strategies. Systemic inflammatory response syndrome, according to the guideline called sepsis 2, is clinical syndrome following inflammation. However, it is difficult to distinguish SIRS following an infection from non-infection one. There are two main laboratory markers of systemic bacterial infections used in practice. Next to procrastinine alone, the use of procrastinine and presepsin in a combination represent, represents the most sensitive diagnostic tool. Actually, meta-analysis provided evidence that the diagnostic accuracy of procalcitonin and perceptin in detection of bacterial infection was very similar, 
and that both are useful to early detection and subsequent reduction of mortality in critical ill patients. There are reference ranges for CRP, procalcitonin, or pesepsin, including those from panel sepsis 2. Actually, CRP or procalcitonin are used to diagnose bacterial infections according to guidelines for neonatal or pediatric care. Specifically, CRP over 15 mg per milliliter uh, per liter or procalcitonin over 2 nanogram per milliliter. New criteria for sepsis care according to panel called sepsis free are used to calculate SOFA score for evaluation of organ dysfunction. This score does not involve uh, CRP, procalcitonin or pesepsin as you can see in the table. At present, procalcitonin and presepsin are not used for diagnosis of sepsis, but are recommended for prognosis, or can be used to differentiate bacterial and viral infections to manage antibiotic treatment. I have selected only a few ACEs from our product list for webinar, namely CRP, procalcitonin, interleukin-6, or MXA assays. We offer CRP assays for human, but also for mouse, rat, or canine species, and human and canine for procalcitonin assays. Those for human species, including CRP, procalcitonin, or interleukin-6 are CEIVD labeled and therefore also suitable for research or small clinical studies. We also offer several assays for research purpose. One of them, azurocidin, is a potent inducer of increased vascular permeability and might be a useful biomarker of predicting outcome in patients with severe sepsis. Another one, endocan, is considered to be early marker of sepsis or clusterin, which is protein chaperone used by cells in proteosynthesis. High degree of proteosynthesis leads to depletion of clusterin depot and consequent sharp deterioration of health. Low serum clustering concentration is therefore strongly associated with mortality. Enemic A marker. It is a marker of systemic viral infections, complementing inflammatory and bacterial infection markers. Human microvirus uh, resistance protein 1 is a human protein, which is upregulated in response to interferon type 1 and type 3, and constitutes an important antiviral factor with broad antiviral activity to uh, diverse RNA viruses. In addition, some studies expand the range of MXA antiviral activity to include also DNA viruses. The protein is actually intracellular protein expressed in many tissues, including blood mononuclear cells. One of biological functions of MXA is related to its ability to bind viral nucleocapsid upon entry into the cytosol and prevents from its transportation into the nucleus. As a consequence, primary transcription of the viral genome cannot take place. MXA is a multipotent protein with effects also on DNA viruses. MXA directs nucleocapsids to alternative sites in cytoplasm, where they are immobilized and subsequently degraded. Biovendor holds the license from Kiowa Medex, who is now part of Hitachi. And Biovendor developed the commercial assay for MXR determination. There are several clinical applications of the kit, and one of the most important is screening of individuals with upper respiratory tract infections and in identify those with viral infection. MXA has to be de determined in whole blood cell disease as it is a cytosolic protein. There are typical MXA values over 40 nanogram per ml for patients with systemic viral infections 
and for patients with bacterial infection under 40 nanogram per ml. The difference among MXA levels in patients with viral or bacterial infections or in healthy controls is presented in the graph published by Kiowa Group. Patients with different viral infections were ruled in. By the way, the same effect on MXA level is expected for coronavirus, which is RNA virus. The guidelines specify that antibiotics should be prescribed for CRP serum or plasma values over 50 mg per liter. CRP below 50 mg per liter. Uh, there might be either viral infection or bacterial infection at early stage. In such case, it is recommended to retest CRP after next 24 hours or determine CRP together with procalcitonin, or even better to determine CRP together with procalcitonin as the mark of bacterial infection, together with MXA as the mark of viral infection. There are several patient groups who can really benefit from MXA determination. Especially newborns and preterm newborns who do not have developed immunity systems would profit from additional laboratory investigation to CRP. CRP does not have any reference range for newborns and often is not elevated. In my experience, neonatal or pediatric centers might be really interested in MXA measurement. There are some competitors on the 96 well played platform, but if you go through uh, the list by kit by kit, they are either more, ex more expensive or not enough sensitive, or recommend inappropriate type of uh, samples such as serum, plasma, or urine. I believe that only our essay represents appropriate quality. Our MXA essay is based on two monoclonal antibodies. We have reference publications, very well managed paralytic phase, and use native protein for calibration. Also, our quality management during the production is on the same level we do for CEIVD products, despite that MXA ELISA kit is for research use only at present. In summary, MXA is a unique diagnostic tool for differentiation of viral and bacterial infections with patient, in patients with uh, respiratory tract infection. And actually, it was not mentioned directly. It is used for monitoring of patients treated with interferon beta, especially patients with multiple sclerosis. I hope so. I will have a chance to present that application in one of the following webinars. Now we are at the end of my presentation. Uh, I would like to thank you for uh, attention and uh, I hope so uh, you will join the webinar number two, which will be focused on adipocytokines and microRNA assays. Take care and bye bye.